Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. So we are in this very last uh, week of this course on nonlinear adaptive control, and uh, we are talking about some exciting things. And I hope you found the course in general as a rather interesting course. Um, so right now we are uh, going into slightly more, um, say, advanced and research topics, and we have been discussing about learning. So we started the week by trying to create a chronology of how things evolved in adaptive control, and parallelly in um, you know stochastic and discrete systems in the form of self-tuning regulators, um, and also another parallel in the form of uh, learning classification kind of problems. Uh, so I do hope that you, uh, you know, sort of are relatively convinced that whatever algorithms that you've learned through the curriculum uh, will help you drive autonomous systems such as what you see in the background. So, um, so in this paper that we were looking at, we were looking at a very specific, um, uh, you know, learning setting. Yeah, which is now a very popular setting, and that is the one on uh, deep learning. So deep learning is essentially um, uh, learning algorithms that make use of uh, deep neural networks, that is multi-layer neural networks. And that's the sort of application that we are looking at here. One of the uh, sort of differences from what you typically uh, are used to in learning algorithms is that you know, here we uh, have everything to be online. That is, you're doing learning also in real time. So uh, we, of course, um, established a parallel of um, uh, you know deep learning or neural networks with uh, parameter learning. Right. So essentially, that's what it is because you have weights and then you're trying to learn some weights of the different layers on the neural network. Um, so we did establish that parallel and. Uh, the difference here lies in that we are trying to do the learning online, that is real-time learning and control simultaneously, right? So we talked a little bit about uh, where the literature is, right, in the beginning. Um, and we also sort of tried to understand that, um, you know, standard learning rules may not do a great job. And so we, uh, this article talks about some modifications to the learning rules. Right now, um, we also then, of course, uh, discussed a little bit of the background. Right, um, let's see, I want to see where I've marked these. It does not look like I marked the lecture. Um, just a second, I think the first lecture, of course, started from uh, the this paper here. So I think that's fine. That's marked in this paper. Right. So let's see where we were. Okay. I trying to find it. Okay. Right. Just give me a second. All right, not here either. There's the STR. I just want to find where I marked lecture number 12.2. Yes, that's here in the discrete and deterministic systems. And I believe we started, uh, I'm going to mark it here as lecture. And uh, let's see, now this is fine. So this is, yeah, this is all of lecture 12.2, I believe. Yeah, yeah, 
I believe this is all of lecture 12.2. Yes, yes, this is fine. All right, so we do have all the lectures marked. My apologies. Uh, so then we started looking a little bit at the background of what is the problem setup. Pretty standard in most articles that you read. Um, here we talk about the type of norms on matrices and signals and vectors. Then we uh, do the most important definition, which is that of how the neural network looks, which is with one input and one output layer, uh, or you can, and then one hidden layer in between. Right. So this is how you have the three-layer neural network structure. So you have uh, the inputs going in, and then they're scaled by some weights and an offset. Then you get a summation over them. Then that's the second layer where you have this activation function. Right, and uh, then you have uh, sort of the connection uh, with the third layer, which is via this weight w i j and the theta w i offsets. Yeah. So the aim is, of course, for the neural network to identify all these quantities. Yeah. And if you do, then you have a um, very clear relation between functional relationship between x and uh, y, which is the input and the output. Yeah. Don't think of these inputs and outputs as a control, etc. This is a more general setting. All right. So we also saw that there are different possible choices of these uh, activation functions. They can be sigmoidal, hyperbolic, tangent, or radial basis functions. Right. And um, with some, uh, you know, sort of flexibility in terms of how we choose, how we, you know, define our x and uh, you know v and w and so on, uh, we can account for both the weights and the offsets uh, in this sort of a structure, which is this uh, nonlinear regress as parameter form. Why do I say it's nonlinear? Is because you have this, you know, w and also a v here. So this is what makes it uh, nonlinear because both w and v here are unknowns. Right? So usually you would probably just have something like this in a regress as parameter form. Okay, but here you have first two different unknowns and then you also have this activation function which is also potentially not being right? so uh, then of course we talked about what it means for uh, you know uh, something uh, some function to be in the functional range of a neural network and that was defined using this kind of an expression that is if you have the neural network it gives you something like this and then if you have a small epsilon offset from the true value of the function then it's somehow in the functional range right and there are some nice results uh, for specific cases of sigma right we that we were talking about these uh, activation functions um, and for some specific cases of sigma you do have uh, results um, which say that the functional range of the neural network is dense in the set of continuous functions. What uh, we'll try to interpret this result of course. First of all, there is the uh, term squashing function. So, what is a squashing function? Uh, so, basically, it's defined here a squashing function is a bounded, measurable, non decreasing function from the real numbers on to 0, 1. All right. So, basically, uh, this is this kind of function includes the step function, the ramp function, sigmoid function, etc. Right. So, so squashing functions are rather um, relatively large class of functions. Right. So, for these kind of uh, activation functions in your neural network, what this theorem claims is that uh, the functional range of the neural network is dense in continuous functions. So, what does it mean? Uh, this statement. Yeah, for those who have not seen analysis courses, essentially means that almost almost any continuous function can be approximated via this neural network okay 
So this is a very specific neural network, by the way. It's exactly a three-layer neural network. So one input, one output, and one hidden layer, right? So with this specific neural network, you have a result which says that uh, you can approximate almost any continuous function quite well with this neural network, right? So this is what it means. So, um, so of course, the dense is in, the, in terms of the supremum norm. So, so this is the whole idea of how you define dense. Um, in fact, uh, what the authors state here is that the last layer threshold values, that is the offsets, uh, were not even required. Yeah, so the last layer thresholds were not needed for this result. So you don't even need the last layer thresholds for you to have a good approximation. Right? So of course, how to select these sigma uh, and then choosing this into and a particular for a particular set S uh, are of course topics of research. So then there is this section on stability and passivity, uh, which I'm going to skip for now. For now, I'm going to skip it. Yeah, if I do see the need, I will get back to it. Yeah, we have not discussed pass passivity, which is a very standard notion for uh, nonlinear control. And um, if you have a system which is passive, uh, designing controllers becomes uh, sufficiently easy. Uh, this is uh, this is usually covered in a more detailed nonlinear control course, yeah, which uh, we don't aspire to be. We are more of a nonlinear adaptive control course. All right, so we will skip this for now, uh, and we'll see if we need it later on. We will talk about it maybe in passing. Yeah, so. Then in this next section, the authors are uh, starting to look at, uh, oh, by the way, I was supposed to start to mark the lectures. So I'm going to mark it here. Lecture 12.3. All right, so the third lecture of our last week. So in this section C, the authors start to look at the robotic arm dynamics, yeah. Um, why? Because this is the application that the authors are focusing on. Yeah. I mean, if you focus on another application, of course, um, you can write the dynamics for that in a particular form. So uh, this is the standard form for robot dynamics. So it's called the Euler-Lagrange uh, form. So the Euler the EL equations, very standard to call them EL equations. Um, here, this is this is. Um, a structure which holds for all, uh, any n-link robotic manipulator, right? So it is general enough, right? If you have an n-link robotic manipulator, you can use this. And this is written, uh, these equations are written in uh, what is called joint space coordinates, yeah? So if you have any, I mean, I usually make this picture, I will try to make this picture here for you folks. So, if you have any uh, sort of axis, say, right, and then you have a uh, one joint here, right, then you have another joint here and then you have another axis here sorry another uh, sort of link here the joint so this is so this is uh, say joint one okay and this is say joint one this is link one joint two link two and then of course you can mark it right so now if you look at some coordinate system say this is a zero zero this point then this coordinate in the world frame is uh usually has some coordinates in say two dimensional frame x y if it's a planar manipulator if it's not a planar manipulator then it will have all three coordinates but let's keep things simple and say it's a planar manipulator and so these are the coordinates in the world frame but then there is another way to specify these coordinates. So this is, uh, let's see. If you look at this angle, this is say Q1. And you look at this angle, 
this is say q2 yeah so there are two ways to look at uh, robot dynamics or two ways to write the robot dynamics model one is in the joint frame with these q1s and q2s and another is in the world frame which is with this x and y you see that both have equal number in this case in this particular case the number of joint coordinates and number of world coordinates are the same but that is not necessarily true right because i could have 20 joints in a two dimensional frame so i have a lot of redundancy yeah uh, then of course there is many more joint coordinates than there are world coordinates so so and of course there is a forward and inverse kinematics for those who have seen robotics there is forward kinematics to move uh, from the joint coordinates to the world coordinates so that's again something standard joint to world is the forward kinematics and the world to the joint is inverse kinematics yeah so you have these kinematics which means that it's just a relationship between the joint uh, coordinates and the world coordinates and vice versa so that is what is your kinematics equation so so now what these authors are doing they are in this particular problem is they're writing the uh, everything in the joint coordinate so that's why you have this q yeah these are joint coordinates or they are also in euler lagrange dynamical notions called generalized coordinates why are they generalized coordinates because they could represent angle or also linear motion because you could have joints which are just lengthening or shortening right so you could have linear actuators also or you could have angular actuators also in a robot right so this q could represent both length and angle right so that's why uh, q is also called generalized coordinates yeah but but most important to remember is that it is in the joint frame yeah it is not in the world frame okay? so then you have this m which is your uh, inertia matrix so uh, so m is the inertia matrix uh, it is a function of uh, your q which is the joint coordinates then you have vm which is the coriolis and centripetal matrix which is a function of both your q and q dot then you have gq which is usually the gravity matrix then gq is the uh, gravity vector and the gravity sorry not the matrix but the gravity vector and finally f which depends on q dot is the friction right then you have these terms tau and tau d uh, tau d is basically say, any kind of external disturbance right so any kind of external disturbance is sort of put into the tau d uh, you know we have already seen how disturbance gets into adaptive systems so or any non linear system for that matter and we usually assume that these are bounded and even though we may not know what the values are at each instant in time and then you have tau which is the actual torque that i can exert right so when you talk about this tau for example if you look at this manipulator how would you apply this tau you would assume there is a you know uh, there is usually a motor yeah m1 and there is another motor m2 right so you would have some motor here on this joint and another motor here on this joint and this tau is essentially obtained by rotating the motor and it could be whatever i mean you could have a servo drive or you could have a you know i mean dc motor whatever i mean you could have different kinds of motors but the point is that's how you get the torque tau all right great so once you understand uh, how this robot works and how the model looks like of course we are not giving any structure for this m notice if you have a specific robotic model you will have to actually uh, write the dynamics either with your newtonian formulation or with the lagrangian formulation or hamiltonian formulation but the point is you will have to write the dynamics and then once you put it in this structure and you will be able to put it in this structure uh, you will get the expressions for m vm g f and so on excellent excellent so suppose uh, how is the problem formulated i mean any control problem is formulated with some kind of a desired reference trajectory and so this is we are already used to this kind of a notion all right so this is how any uh, control problem is formulated so uh, here you see that your desired trajectory is some qd of t yeah and this 
helps us define an error, which is the true value of the joint. Sorry, which is the, they have defined it in an opposite way. The desired value minus, minus the actual value of the joint variable. All right. So if you have only angles, then the desired value of the angle minus the actual value of the angle. Okay. Now, it is also well known uh, in robotics to use uh, this kind of a filtered tracking error right, in order to do the analysis for this system. This is actually for you folks, this is essentially like a, uh, like a backstepping variable, right? like a backstepping variable why because if you look at this dynamics yeah and if i did write it as you know uh, this can be written as a double integrator sort of dynamics right so if i take q1 as q and q2 as q dot right then what would be my dynamics my dynamics would be q1 dot is q2 and q2 dot or or m q2 dot is equal to minus vm q dot minus g q minus f q dot minus tau d minus plus tau Okay, so this is what would be my uh, state space equations. And if you see, um, if I think of some kind of a backstepping type of algorithm to control them, because this is essentially a nonlinear double integrator, right? Some kind of a nonlinear double integrator. So if I want to use backstepping to design, then I would choose Q2 as some minus lambda Q1, right? Q2 desired would be some minus lambda Q1. And so R is like the backstepping error. Right. So, I mean, of course, I'm writing everything in the error. Uh, if, if QD is zero, if QD was not there, then E is just Q. And forget the sign. The sign is irrelevant. If QD was not there, then E is just Q. Right. So, R becomes Q dot plus lambda Q. Right. So, that's what we said. We will choose Q2 as minus lambda Q1. Right? And the backstepping error would be Right, so let me q2 desired would be something like minus lambda q1. If I was just looking at the stabilization problem, that is, I want to send q1 and q2 to zero, and the backstepping error would be what q2 plus lambda q1. Yeah, and you see, this is and lambda is some positive definite matrix. This is exactly what you have here. Sorry like a q2 plus lambda q1 yeah if there was no desired if there is desired it's the same right i mean if i write it in terms of the desired variable i will get something very similar right because if i wrote this as e1 dot e1 and e2 it will be e1 dot equal to e2 and me2 dot will be some equation on the right hand side okay i'll still get something very similar it doesn't matter if it's tracking or stabilization so this is like the backstepping uh this is like a backstepping error variable yeah so it's very standard to use this in uh, robotics why it's obvious right because it's a just a nonlinear double integrator and for if you want to get some kind of strict Lyapunov function or get some good Lyapunov candidate this is the what makes sense yeah so, so of course lambda is some positive definite symmetric matrix right i mean you can of course have it as a scalar uh, usually you select it as some diagonal matrix Right. You can either have a scalar or a diagonal matrix. You can also have a full matrix, just positive definite symmetric. Okay. It's just a design parameter if you want. Okay. Now, if I take the derivative of R and I plug in from my uh, equations here, right, it's not difficult to see that I will get this kind of an equation. Okay. It's not difficult to see that I'll get this kind of an equation, right? Because uh, it should be evident to you that M r dot is equal to m e double plus uh, 
m lambda e dot right and m e double dot so this is just m times uh, e double dot sorry this is m e double dot is m q d double dot m q d double dot minus n q double dot so minus n q double dot is this guy minus n q double dot is uh, essentially v n q dot uh, v q v n q dot plus g q plus f q dot plus tau d minus tau plus m lambda e dot all right okay so this is this big thing that you get all right so uh, so what you do is you can write this uh uh, you know what you will do is you will write this whole thing you want to write this whole thing as a, this guy and you want to write this whole thing as this guy all right and how do you do that you simply uh, you know you add and subtract minus vmr okay? and yeah, you just add and subtract minus vmr and then you combine it with this guy okay? So what do you have? You will have, uh, you know, this. So so this f is essentially to encapsulate all the remaining terms. So you have these two terms here, right? Then you have uh, from here and from here you have these guys. Then you have this term, uh, this term here. Then you have this fq dot coming from here. Okay, and of course we have retained the, uh, you know, the the tau d and tau have been retained as it is, right? So I just need to check the sign. I, I think there is some sign issue here, or did I miss the sign thing? Somehow the sign seems off, right? Uh, if I take mr dot, have m e double dot minus m sorry, m e double dot plus m lambda e dot, which is fine. And so from m e double dot, I have m q d double dot minus m q double dot minus m q double dot. I see. I see. So I think I messed up the sign. So this has to be all of this is with a plus sign. All of this actually has a plus sign. Right? So now it's okay. This is fine. So all of this has a plus sign on it. So this uh, this is all fine. So then I have tau d minus tau. All right. So this f is what encapsulates this kind of a nonlinear robot function. So why do we call it a non-linear robot function is because this is what uh, sort of encapsulates the dynamics of the robot. Of course, there's also VM, but we're not going to worry about that term. Um, this is what, encapsulate, what encapsulates what the dynamics looks like, right? So, uh, and this is this FX, yeah, where, where of course, uh, we have chosen X to include all these quantities, E, e dot, Q, D, Q, D dot, Q, D double dot, basically, um everything that shows up here you have q d double dot dot uh q d dot yeah e and so on so you have all the variables appearing here and so it's a function of all the variables x yeah so you have uh that's how you sort of put it yeah of course it's also a function of q which is not written here but then that is already inside e right so that's fine too. Okay. So great. So 
this is the sort of simple, relatively simpler structure that we'll work with. We'll try to drive R to zero. Uh, we look at what that means in the subsequent session, right? So we'll, we'll look at what that means in the subsequent session. So essentially what we have done today is we have sort of continuing our discussion on learning based or adaptive control based learning. Uh, and uh, we are using it for a planar robotic manipulator. And so today we spend some time understanding the dynamics of the manipulator. And in the subsequent session, we hope to look at the control design part of the manipulator. So I hope you're enjoying our sessions and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.